Thank you very much, worship team. We're reading Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24 to 29. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, this is Christ speaking, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have now reached the conclusion of our series on the kingdom principles uh, that we started from Matthew chapter 5 as taught by Christ himself. The title of today's message is Build Your House on the Rock. Build Your House on the Rock. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for life. We thank you, Lord, for liberty. We thank you, Lord, for health. We thank you, Lord, for the peace that surpasses all understanding. We thank you, Lord, because you have gathered us together today. And unto you, O Lord, have your people gathered, O God. Lord, we have so many reasons to thank you. Lord, we pray that our thanksgiving will be acceptable to you this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, even as we go into your word, Lord, we pray that you will come and do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, come and quicken your word even in our hearing and in our hearts. Holy Spirit, come and open our eyes to the truth of the Father even as it comes forth from his scriptures this morning, O Lord. Holy Spirit, come and prepare every heart to be a heart of, that is of, for good soil, O oh Lord, a heart of good soil that even the entrance of God's word will bring light and understanding even to our simple minds, O oh Lord. Father, Lord, we pray that your name alone will be glorified even as your word comes forth this morning, O oh God. We pray, Lord, that you will take all the glory, O oh Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So the central message of the text we read just now, as we probably notice, is that uh, here we see Christ is drawing a contrast uh, between some individuals that he considered to be wise and those that he considered to be foolish. Um, this is Jesus that is making this determination. He said, I liken that person. I liken that person to a wise man or a wise woman, or I liken that person to a foolish man or a foolish woman. So Christ is the one that is making this determination, not me. And Jesus is then saying that the difference between the person who is wise and the one who is foolish has to do with what they do with his sayings. So Jesus has been speaking, we have been reading from the chapter 5, we've been reading the sayings of Christ. He's the one who has been speaking exclusively in this, over these three chapters that we've covered. And Jesus now has ended his sayings and then he's telling us that anyone who hears all the things that he has been saying and does them, that he likens to a wise person. In contrast, anyone who hears all that he has said and does not do them, he likens to a foolish person. And so we see that there is, you know, the difference between the wise and the foolish is simply a matter of obedience. A matter of obedience. And we're talking about obedience in its complete sense. Because Jesus made it clear that he has said many things. So it's not a matter of picking and choosing which ones we want to obey. Because that is nothing more than just disobedience. There is little difference between partial obedience and total disobedience. Any obedience that is not total is simply disobedience. And we see that there, the outcomes for the wise and the foolish are very different. 
Now here we see Christ uses the analogy of building one's own house. Building your own house. And we will spend the rest of this message just focusing on that. Building one's own house. This, Jesus is using that as his analogy for teaching us the difference between total obedience to his sayings and disobedience to his sayings. So we'll do this using three points. The first point is that foundation is important. Foundation is important. The second point we'll use is that we'll use to uh, look into this is Christ is the true foundation. Christ is the true foundation. And our third point is the authority of Christ. The authority of Christ. So the first point is found foundation is important. Christ is the true foundation and the authority of Christ. So the first point, I'm sure most of us will, have, will acknowledge and realize by now that foundation is critical to any part of any physical, is a critical part of any physical building. In fact, I believe when they do inspection codes and building ins inspections and things like that, I don't think you'll be able to get far if you say, oh, I've built my house, but I didn't put any foundation in it. You will not get very far with that. Foundation in a physical building of any kind or any kind of physical structure is very important. No one will drive over a bridge that they know has no foundation. Nobody will climb up a skyscraper or get into an elevator to go into a skyscraper that you hear that it has a compromised or it has no foundation. But it's also important for us to recognize that Christ is speaking here that, you know, our lives are also like buildings. Our lives, in fact, are full of different buildings. And what do I mean by that? So we are in a state of constantly building out. In our lives, we may have an educational or professional career. That is a building. You build it from the ground up. From kindergarten, you start building. You build, you build all the way to whatever, to being a CEO or whatever it is you choose to become, a full-term full professor. That is one aspect of life that we build. You also build relationships, build relationships with your siblings, with your friends, you know, with your fiance, with your spouse. And then it, the marriage itself is also a building. You build it from year to year. Here in the U.S., financial profile is also something you build. I'm sure we are all familiar with the term, build up your credit history. I remember when I first got into this country and I was trying to do some things and they were telling me, no, you can't do that. What's your credit history? I'm like, what is that? <laughs> the country where I came from, we don't do credit history. It's like, you have to build up your credit. Yeah, I remember I was to get my first cell phone. I couldn't get a cell phone without having a credit history. So you have to build it. And then over time, I started to understand that yes, there is such a thing as your financial profile. It has a significant impact on everything you do. You're getting loans, um, you know, getting a mortgage, whatever it is you do, but you build it. That's we use the word we build. And so in life, we are constantly building our life. We are constantly, so it's not just physical things that need to be built, but we also build our life. And so with this, this observation, we can see that a good foundation, just as it's critical in a physical building, is also critical in all the buildings in our life. Just as a foundation is critical in a physical building, it's also critical in every aspect of our lives. It's important in our homes, in our relationships, in our careers, in our finances. Let's turn quickly to Psalm 11 verse 3, just to see what the psalmist has to say about the importance of a foundation. Psalm 11 verse 3. Um, The psalmist says here that if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And this is true in pretty much any aspect of life that we may consider. If you just think in our own personal life, if the foundations are destroyed or they are compromised or they don't exist, what can, we, what can the righteous do? And that leads us to ask the question, what kind of foundation are you building your life upon? Are you building your finances upon? Are you building your marriage upon? Are you building your relationships upon? What kind of foundation are you building your career upon? If you are raising children, what kind of foundation are you building them upon? 
These are the important questions that we see here even in our message today. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Unfortunately, we live in a time where there is a desire to build quickly. You know? Because you see, the foundation itself, nobody actually sees it. No one really sees the foundation. It's not something we behold. But we do see the edifices that are built upon it. We see the glamour, the big buildings that are built. We see the glamorous cars. We see the success that comes from, that have been built on a very good foundation. And so oftentimes we see people just focus on that and they forget that, yes, in fact, there was a point in time there is something residing there below that all of this is resting upon. And that's why Jesus says that you build, wise man who built his house on something. Every good thing is built on something. Every good thing that you see is built on something. So what kind of foundation are we building upon? The foundation is very important. And so what found, kind of foundation are we building our lives upon? And this will take us to the, second, to the second point. So let's just hold that question. That Christ is the right, is the true foundation. Is the true foundation for every aspect of our lives. Every aspect of our lives. There is no aspect of your life that Christ is not a foundation for. That his words is not the right place for you to build upon. There is no aspect. I can, I can assure you of that. And that is what, if you go back to our main text in Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus is saying that, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Why does Jesus use the analogy of building a house? We've talked already about how, you know, one thing in our life is like a building. It has a foundation. But we see here that Jesus is not just even using the analogy of building any building. He's saying building your own house. Not building somebody else's house, but your own house. So in other words, Jesus is talking to us in a very personal way. Because he could have said, whoever builds a building, and you know, there are all kinds of buildings. There are you know, offices and schools and all that. But how many of us agree that we are not as intimate with our school building as we are with our own home? We are not as intimate with our friend's home, our neighbor's home, as we are with our own home. Regardless of how, what the size, the type of our home is, it is our home. It's our place of refuge. It's our place of rest. It's our place, our hiding place. And so Jesus is then likening it and saying that you have a, the wise man who built his house. So Jesus is talking to us personally, very, very personally. That his words have something to do with the choices we make in our life. With the, with the choices that we make in our life. So Jesus is the true foundation. So why do we need a foundation? Well, one thing we see here that Jesus is telling us is that a physical building, just going with that analogy, after it's been built, is exposed. It's exposed to what? To time. And with time comes what? Even if nothing else, comes wear and tear. Wear and tear is a reality for any physical structure that you see. But Jesus is saying that there's even more than that. Their elements will beat on it. The rain will fall upon it. The flood will come against it. The winds will blow against it and beat upon it. This is the lot of any building, any physical building. By the same token, Jesus is telling us that even in our own lives, we will experience challenges even here on this earth. How do we know this? Because this is the sad reality of the fall of Adam and Eve. Let's turn quickly to Job chapter 14, verse 1 to 2. Why do we need a true foundation? Job chapter 14, 1 to 2. Job here is uh, someone who we, we will all agree experienced a lot of storms in his life. So he speaks at the very height of it. He says, man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. Life is full of challenges. It is full of all kinds of challenges. And unfortunately, we see in the world that we live today, one, a lot of people do not recognize that life itself is a building. So they don't consider that, oh, I need to build up my life. 
And secondly, they don't recognize that I need to build it on Christ. And so for this reason, we see a lot of consequences. We see things like you know, depression, marital failures, professional failures, financial ruin, all coming because people have not chosen or they failed to build their life upon Christ. That will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Because of, the, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, it is such that we live in a world, we live in a life that is full of all kinds of troubles in every aspect of life. And we see here that what Jesus is also saying here in Matthew chapter 7, notice what he says concerning the wise man. Notice what he says. He does not say that the wise man will not experience any of these things. He does not say that when the wise man who builds his house on the rock, well, it's not going to rain upon him. The wind is not going to blow upon him. The flood is not going to hit him. In fact, we see that Jesus says that the experience of the wise and of the foolish are exactly the same. That is the experience, what they experience, but their outcomes are not the same. And that is where Jesus makes the difference. The one who builds his foundation, whose foundation is Christ, his outcome is going to be different. And here we are talking just about the physical aspect of life. But then there's also another aspect, which is eternity. Man, man, every man is conceived into a state where they are separated from God. They are conceived in iniquity. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56 tells us that the sting of sin, of death, is sin. The sting of death is sin. It's a very famous verse. What does that mean? That means anyone who dies in sin, that is actually when they are truly lost. As long as you're alive, there's still a chance for you to be saved. But if you die in a state of sin, the Bible says there is no repentance in the grave. And so we all come into this world separated from God, but by the grace of God, by the sacrifice of Christ, we are able, we have an access through the salvation to be reunited with God, to be reconciled to God. But for those who do not take, take, up, take, uh, take a hold of this opportunity, the Bible tells us that the sting of death is sin. It's at that point of death that the fact that they are separated from God actually matters. Because for as long as they are alive, there's still a room for repentance. So death in itself is not a terrible thing. It's just the death of the sinner that is a terrible thing. And so Christ, so not just in the physical aspect of life is Christ the true foundation for us, but even in the spiritual, even in the eternal perspective, Christ is the right foundation. Because only him can save us. No one can come to the Father except through Christ. There are many who have come and claimed to be pathways to God. But only Christ is the true door. Only Christ is the true way. He is the only one that can save to the othermost, as the Bible tells us. In Hebrews 7.25, it tells us that it is only he. Let's turn to that quickly. Hebrews 7.25. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I tell you, there is no other person that can make this sort of claim when it comes to eternity. No other person can make this sort of claim. So we see that Christ is the true foundation, and we can look into that a little bit more. In what ways is he the true foundation? Well, one, he has promised us his peace in the storms of life. He has promised us his peace in the storms of life. John 14, 27. John 14, 27 tells us, read quickly there, it says that, Peace I leave you with, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 tells us, The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind. In Christ Jesus. So yes, the, the, yes, even the, the wise man will experience storms even here on this earth. But one assurance we have, one promise that he has, is that he will not go through it alone. 
he will not, his heart need not be troubled because the peace of God that passes understanding is available to him in Christ Jesus. All you have to do is plant your life. Plant all of the aspects of your life, your finances, your career, your marriage. Plant it on Christ. Plant it on the words of Christ. And you will see that you will not be troubled. Yes, challenges may arise. Yes, troubles may come. But the peace that passes on the all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So even when the foolish person is running helter-skelter because of the storms of life, because of challenges in the marriage, challenges in the career, the wise person can live with a peace, a sense of peace, knowing fully well that God is in control. That our Heavenly Father has not abandoned us. In fact, he's promised us, in some, the second point is that he has promised us deliverance in times of adversity. We can look quickly there in Psalm 34, 4, and 17. Psalm 34, 4. Psalm 34, 4 here, the psalmist tells, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Verse 14, of the same chapter. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Not out of some of them, but out of them all. This is the promise that we have when we lay our lives, we build our lives on Christ as the true foundation. Romans 8.28 tells us that all things work together for good of them who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So yes, in the physical, things may not seem to be going the way we want them to, do, to go. But how many of us realize that God holds tomorrow in his hands? As human beings, we cannot see beyond the next second, the next minute. But yet, we have a servant God who holds tomorrow in his very hands. And so, we should be rest assured because his promises for us are real. His promises for us are sure. He has promised to keep us and to deliver us, not to forsake us. So we might see people in the world might put their trusts in chariots and in horses, as the Bible said. People might put their trusts in their wealth. They might put their trusts in the connections that they have and who they know. But then they get surprised because at the end of it all, that is not sufficient to save them. That is not sufficient to save them. In fact, the people that they put their trust in, those, those ones themselves, they can't secure themselves. You know, you trust in somebody that, oh, this person, I'm just believing this person. What if that person is removed the next day? What happens? You know? But we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. And so in the physical things of our lives, in every area of our life, in the various things we are building into our life, if we build upon the word of God, and we'll come to that in a second, then we will experience the Christ that is the true foundation. Because then our lives will not fall apart. Our lives will not fall apart. Because that's what Jesus says concerning the foolish man. The foolish man, when the wind blows, when the floods came, when the rain came, it said great was the fall. So we see that even doesn't matter how big the building is. It said great was the fall. No matter how great the building is. If it is on the wrong foundation, then it will not stand the test of time or the test of adversity. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So the other point that we want to make here is that what is, the, what is the wisdom that we see here that Jesus is talking about? We see that the wisdom is in obedience. We go back to Matthew 7 verse 24. See, Jesus simply says that, Therefore, who hears the sayings of mine and does them? That is the wisdom in obedience. It's not just in hearing. It's not just in memorizing and knowing it. It's not just even in preaching it. It is actually in doing it. It doesn't matter how much of the word of God that we keep in our hearts if we do not do them. Because the psalmist tells that the purpose of keeping the word of God in our heart is so what? So that we may not sin against him. Yes, in today's world, we might hear of people who call themselves Bible scholars or theologians, but you look at their lives and you see these ones, they are not living in accordance of what the knowledge they know. 
So it is not the knowledge that saves or delivers. It is in the doing. And that's why we see in James chapter 1, 22 to 25. Let's read that quickly. James chapter 1, 22 to 25. James chapter 1 from verse 22, it says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Romans 2 verse 13 also t- expresses the same, gives us the same message. Romans 2 verse 13. I'll quickly read that. Romans 2 13 says, For not the errors of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So, uh, so what we see here is that it doesn't matter how many messages we listen to, or how much we read the Word of God, or how much of it we've committed into our hearts that we can recite. If we are actually not doing it, then it's of no use to us. Because like, like James said, it's like going to a mirror, right? And observing yourself, and then you do nothing about it, and you just walk away, you forget what you look like. If you needed to make adjustments, you did not make the adjustments. If there was a stain on your head, you did not rub off the stain. If your hair was a mess, you did not adjust your hair. You just looked in the mirror, yes, I see myself, and then I walk away. Of what use is that? It was better you did not even look in the mirror. So the wisdom, that, that the real wisdom in life is obedience to God. That is the true wisdom. It's not an accumulation of wealth. It's not an accumulation of knowledge. It's not an accumulation of strength or popularity. It's simply in obedience. And you know one thing that's wonderful about that is that all of us can do that. It does not cost you any dollar to be obedient. You don't have to be six foot four to be obedient. Because you some of us who are very short, we can't make it in the NBA. We are too short. But we can obey. God has made the bar so low that every human being can meet it. So you and I, we can be wise. The bar to being wise is very low. I'm not saying it's easy, because we still need the Holy Spirit to help us with it. But the bar is very low. Anyone can attain and reach for it. For us to be wise, all we have to do is obey. Obey. Let's move to the third point, which is the authority of Christ. So we've seen that foundation is important. If you do not build on the right foundation, then you are really taking a risk. Because life has challenges. Life, there are challenges in life. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are. It doesn't matter how much anointing you have. It doesn't matter how prolific you are at casting out demons and binding, you will have challenges in this world. This is what Jesus said. But he says you should be of cheer, of of good cheer, because what? I have overcome. This is what he says here. The rain, the the, the rain will come, the winds will come just as it comes to the foolish one. But the difference is in our obedience. That is what makes the outcome different. I pray the Lord will help us in the area of obedience in Jesus' name. Amen. The authority of Christ. So let's go quickly to verse 28 of, our, of Matthew chapter 7. This is where Christ is concluding his teaching. So read there, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So we see here that as Christ concluded his teachings, we see that the reaction of the people was that of astonishment. They were astonished. They were not just impressed by what he had to say. They were not just, you know, listening and mesmerized by what he had to say, 
but they were actually astonished. And verse 29 tells us why they were astonished. It's because they taught as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And maybe the significance of this might still be lost upon us, but we have to consider who is a scribe. Who is a scribe? Let's turn quickly. We've been in our uh, Bible study, we've been talking about one of such people uh, who is a scribe, Ezra. So let's turn quickly to Ezra chapter 7, verse 6 and 11. Who is a scribe? Ezra chapter 7, verse 6. This Ezra came up from Babylon, and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Stand quick, let's flip forward to verse 11. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So who is a scribe? Expert. An expert. Expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Okay, so let's go back to where, to, to what we just, to what we, our main text in Matthew chapter 7. So the people were astonished that Christ spoke as someone with authority, but not as the scribes. In our modern day time, term, what, what, what do we con when, we, when we talk about any sort of uh, area of specialization, like law, for example, who do you turn to? You turn to an expert. Someone will be called a legal scholar. They, you know, they have different rankings for them, but there are some that are considered to be you know, the, the, the greatest minds. They call them experts. And so you listen to them. In fact, I mean, those of us who watch, um, you know, maybe the news or topical issues like sports or finance, you sit, you tune in to listen to who? To the experts. Because you think you can gain something from them, from their expertise that they've built over time. And so these are the people that, and so what we're seeing here is that the people who are listening to, to Jesus, this wasn't the first time they were having a teacher. So that's not why they were astonished. They were not astonished because Jesus was, they were hearing the word of God for the first time. No. They had teachers, they had scribes. And they've had experienced teaching from the scribes. But they said, well, yeah, we've heard our experts teach us the word of God, but not like this. Because Christ had authority. And so why did Christ have this authority? Well, the first point is that Christ himself is the word. He himself is the living word of God. All of the commands and the statues that the scribes become expert in, Christ himself is the fulfillment of that word. And what that tells us is that the word of God itself is the greatest authority there is. It's not in the messenger who holds on the mic to preach the word of God to you. That's not where the power is. That is not where the power is. It is not in the language that the word of God is presented to you. That is not where the power is. It is not in how powerful, how, how high the, word, the, the English language or how, you know, the kind of literary strengths that the person has, the oratory skills that the preacher has. That is not where the power is. The power of God resides in the word of God. That is where the authority comes from. The word that can sanctify. Jesus tells us in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word. Not the preachers of your word. Thy word is truth. Ephesians 5, 26. We can turn to that or take note of that in the interest of time. But it basically tells us that the word of God washes and cleans the church. The word, not the preacher. Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 35, that the heaven and earth may pass away, but his word will not pass away. So when Jesus speaks and he teaches with authority and the people recognize the authority in him, they see the power of the Holy Spirit coming forth through the word of God. Let's turn quickly to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll read verse 1 through 5, where Apostle Paul makes this point to the Corinthian church. 
First Corinthians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 5. Apostle Paul, anyone who's, I mean, we've all read Apostle Paul. He's a legal scholar. He's a legal mind. You know, I read romance sometimes and I'm like, wow. The legal arguments and the way they are laid together and connected together, you're like, wow. This man is a profound, deep thinker. But look at what he has to say even concerning his preaching to the church in Corinth. And it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in what? The power of God. The authority of the word of God does not come from the preacher. It doesn't matter how many letters they have behind their name, how many years they spent in theology school. That is not where the authority of the word of God comes from. It comes from the word itself. And this is one of the reasons why each and every one of us are equipped to be declarers of the word of God. How many of you agree with that? You can declare the word of God as well as anybody else. Because as Apostle Paul said here, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human, of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. We have God has blessed us with great preachers who are able to present the word to us. But both in, in, in ways that can reach us. But more importantly, the authority, the power itself comes from the word that they are presenting. Not in the way they present it. And that's why for us as a church, in the modern times that we live in, we should be careful not to subtract from the word of God for whatever reason. Or to add to the word of God for whatever reason. Because we might, you know, it's easy to fall into this, into this illusion that, well, you know, I mean, the Bible was written by, who wrote the Bible? It was a bunch of shepherds, maybe some lawyers, some warriors, illiterate people, some fishermen. I mean, what do they know about the modern time? I mean, what do they know about the internet? What do they know about social media? What do they know about this? It's very easy for us to say, okay, maybe we need to adapt the word of God. For the modern time. But this will be a mistake. This will be a big mistake. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 10 to 11. Um, we don't have time to read that. But it tells us that Christ himself is the foundation of the church. And the point I'm trying to make here is that if the church that you see standing today. is not standing because of any man. It's standing because of Christ. Even though we live in a time where Christianity is fashionable. But I'll tell you, 500, 500 years ago, Christianity was not fashionable. A thousand years ago, Christianity was not fashionable. In the Roman Empire, Christians were persecuted, routinely were killed. It was not fashionable. And so it was not the persuasive words of any man that kept the church going. It was the word of God. It was Christ himself. He is the foundation of the church. And so even as we go through a time where it seems like, well, you know, church is fashionable. We should not make the mistake that the way we can reach the world, the lost world, is by changing the word of God. We cannot dilute the foundation. As the psalmist said, if the, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Christ is the true foundation for every aspect of our lives. We've seen him as the foundation for the church. He is the reason why the church is still standing. It says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church until it's coming. It doesn't matter. Even in countries where, you know, Christians are persecuted, the church continues to grow. Even in China, it is estimated that there are more Christians in China than there are in the U.S. And the reason you will see that that can make sense is because China is a billion people. And so if you have like even just 10% as being Christians, that is it. That is it. It's said that there are you know, over 50 million Christians in China. And these are not, um, I mean, I don't mean to, 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 
to insult the church, our Christians here, but those are like real Christians. And what do I mean by that? These are the people who gather together in some basement somewhere, and maybe they have only access to one passage of the Bible, and then, you know, in secret, they, they worship. You know, they don't bother themselves with the, with, I guess, all the fluff that we've sort of added to church here. There are people who realize that if the authorities find them where they are, they are going straight to jail. So imagine that. But what is it that keeps them going? It is the word. It is the word. A passage here, a passage there. Can you imagine that? You and I, we have the entire scripture in front of us. But there are some people who just survive on a passage here, a passage there. On the spoken word that someone comes and gives them a verse. And they hold on to it. And they build their faith on it. And Christ continues to be the foundation of that church. It's not in any excellence of any man's wisdom. Yes, here we are. I will say somewhat spoils. We have the benefits of great preachers. Geo can preach to us. Charles Stanley can preach to us. David Jeremiah can preach, preach to us. So all the great, great preachers that God has with us. Yes, we can listen to all of them. We can watch them on our phones. But there are some people where, the, if you're behind the Great Wall of China, anyone knows who the Great Wall of China is? The, the, the firewall. When you're in China, you cannot access all the internet that we access. It is all censored. So yeah, we have people in China who have never heard Gio preach before. Who have never heard Billy Graham preach before. Because they just don't have the access to it. But yet, those guys are passionate. They are fervent. They are faithful. Why? Because the word of God upholds them. The authority of Christ. So the authority of Christ is that he himself is the living word. He is the embodiment of the word. And he is the one who builds up our faith. Because when he spoke, the spirit of God goes, speaks with him. Our faith is not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So as we conclude, build your house on the rock. What aspect of your life matters to you that you are building up? Is it your marriage? Is it your career? Is it your relationships? Is it your finance? What is it? What Jesus is telling us in Matthew chapter 7, as we return to our main texts, is that we have a choice. We do have a choice. We can hear all of his words and we can do them and we can be wise. So that when the tests of time, the tests of affliction, the tests of adversity, the storms of life come against us, all that we've built will stand rather than fall. If we choose to be foolish and we build our lives upon wealth, build it upon connections, build it on popularity, build it, build it on everything else besides the word of God. We are assured, and I assure you, I mean, if you look around in life, you will see examples of this over and over again. It will fall apart. When the storms of life comes, it will fall apart. The storms come to both the good and to the evil. Do not we should not think that, oh yeah, I will just try and follow, follow and so there will be no storms in my life. No, that's not how it works. The promise that we are given is that the storms may come. The rains may come. The floods may come. Isaiah 40, 43 verse 2. I'll finish up on this passage. Just to encourage us. Isaiah 43 verse 2. Start from verse 1. Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord... Who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel? Fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. This is the promise that we have. And this is why we, it is wise for us to build our lives on the word of Christ. It is wise for us to choose obedience over sacrifice. 
it is wise for us to focus to realize that the only Christ is the only firm foundation. All other things will be shaken. But the firm foundation will never be shaken. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have placed before us a choice this morning. Because you have given us your word in its completeness, in its fullness. That is relevant for every question that we have in our lives. Such that we don't have to say we need to seek elsewhere for wisdom. And Lord, you've told us that the wisdom is in obedience to you. Wisdom is in obedience to every word that you've given to us. And so Lord God, as your children, we fall humbly this morning, this afternoon, asking for the grace to be obedient, O Lord. The grace to obey all, all of your sayings. Because your word says that not a tittle, not a jot of your word shall fall to the ground void. Father God, give us the wisdom to build upon you, O Lord. In our marriages, in our relationships, in our finances, in our careers, our education. Lord, give us the wisdom. Let us see that it is wise to build upon your word. And not build upon our own way or our own wisdom, O oh God. The Bible tells us that there is a way that seemeth good unto man. But the end thereof is of destruction. Lord, please help us to always realize that we cannot see beyond our noses. No matter how much knowledge we seem to have acquired, no matter how many degrees we seem to have acquired, or how many years of experience we seem to have acquired, the way that seem right unto man, but therein is destruction. Father, Lord, help us to be obedient children, O God. Help us to obey every part of your word, O Lord. And we pray, Lord, that even as you do so, your grace will continue to abound to us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers, O Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's share the grace and fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name.